the purchase and sale agreement is going forward um, without any significant obstacles. So that means it is important for us to work on the request for proposals so that we get something out hopefully early in the spring. Um, oh, okay, so I was sorry, I was gonna do minutes and then I almost skipped by it again. So are there any concerns with the regular December meeting minutes? And I don't have them in front of me, so uh, I could be have them in front of me, but I don't. Does anyone have any comments on those? Or can I assume that then they're accepted as uh, submitted in draft and we can permanently put them in our in the archive or actually on our website. Okay, that's good. Then um, we got two out of three minutes from executive sessions and sorry, they're not consecutive. One was October and one was December. So we have to approve those tonight and then uh, by next month, we should have the November executive session minutes to be approved as well. So are there any questions or comments on either of those? And again, I'm sorry, I don't have those in front of me. Okay, then I'm going to assume that they are accepted as distributed. And again, they go into the permanent archive where they will be kept for at least 100 years. <laughs> okay. Then moving right along, uh, what I wanted to do was review uh, the RFP. And my goal in doing so is to make sure that everyone is oriented to what we're doing. We did have a meeting of the uh, RFP working group, which included Frances, although she wasn't able to stay with us the entire time, Carol, Erica, uh, Rita and myself, and we'll be meeting again. I haven't announced this formally, but on January 28th, that's a Thursday evening. I think of making it at 630 because people seem to have blocks of time available then. And so that's when our next meeting is. And I'll send everybody a note to, uh, tonight or tomorrow. So, uh, John. Can you put the RFP on? And actually, could you first put on the, the separate Word file uh, that was the report of the meeting before we go to the RFP? Yes. Let's see. Someday I'm going to learn how to do this. But I have to confess, I haven't figured this out yet, even though I know you do share a screen. But then I wasn't quite sure how you identify the file that you wanted to be shared. So there are a few things out of that that I wanted people to know about um, in part because uh, they limit what we're gonna be able to do. Well, let's see. So as we go over this, as John's getting to put the first uh, item up, I wanted to say the purpose of this review, as I said, is to orient people to this task, to let you know what's coming and where we are now and where I anticipate we're going. But also, I don't wanna leave this out, to give anybody an opportunity to weigh in if they have any advice for the drafting committee as we go along. So those are our purposes and uh, We'll be able to. I think Eric is in the waiting room. Oh, okay. Let me get Erica in here first. Okay. Okay, she should be joining us. And I will swap screens. I can see why we have me and Nate. Okay, welcome, Erica. Um, we're just starting to go over. 
really the issues that we talked about in our drafting committee meeting. So everybody else is oriented to what we're trying to do and also has an opportunity to weigh in. Okay, so these are the minutes that John prepared. Uh, okay, so let's see. Yeah, I mentioned that after the finance committee or during the finance committee meeting, Rita noted two issues. One is that we may be constrained to uh, work with a nonprofit provider. There were two other things that were identified then that 100% of the units at Belchertown Road would have to be affordable up to 100% area median income. And also that the town would be required to retain ownership of the property, which means we must have a 99 year lease. We cannot sell the property to a developer. So those are three constraints. We've asked uh, Dave Zomack to talk to town council uh, to verify those. Uh, people may recall that uh, Rob Mora offered a conceptual plan that was provided to town council as well as to us. Um, one of the things, again, we learned in the finance committee that the average unit is 786 or 87 square feet, uh, the way uh, Rob put it together. Basically, that's because he felt like the footprint on that property of the building had to be limited to some 13,000 plus square feet. Then he had three floors and when you add it all up together, uh, and then divide by the number of units, that's what you get for average square feet. Um, that could be fine, but I'm not sure that it is because I'm assuming as we worked on the East Street School Plan, we're gonna want this site also to have a preponderance of units that would be two and three bedrooms to accommodate families. If that's the case, I think an average square feet of 780 something might be too small. That average probably has to go up a bit, which means we wouldn't be able to get 40 units on the site if the footprint remained the same. I will say at the end of the day, that's gonna be up to the developer to decide. Um, but it probably means, as I said, that we can't count on getting 40 units out of that part of the property. Um, for the moment, we're going along on the assumption that we're really doing one combined RFP for both the Belchertown Road site and the East Street School site. Um, there are a variety of reasons to do that, which I think we've discussed, but if someone has some questions or comments about that now or at some point in the future, um, I can address it or Rita would probably do a better job than me addressing it. Anybody have any comments? Uh, I just have one quick question, um, which is that if there, uh, I guess if the Belchertown Road is more restrictive because it's being purchased with CPA funds, um, right. or it can only be, uh, you know, we, only nonprofits are eligible to develop the, the property, et cetera, all the other uh, constraints that you talked about. Um, does that also limit who would who, who are eligible developers for the East Street School, East Street School project as well, or like, I, I just, or maybe maybe the pool of potential developers is so small that it doesn't particularly matter that much. But I was just wondering if that might hamstring our flexibility with respect to the East Street School project. Well, it does, but as a practical matter, it may not make much difference. Well, um, the East Street School, as our last RFP. Um, had included would allow a developer to include market rate units as well as affordable units. We can't do that on the Belchertown site. Um, but what that means is that if a developer, for-profit developer came in and said, 
well, I want to do the E Street School and I want to do a mix of market rate and affordable housing, then we have a question of whether we want to let, allow the two sites to be severable. And if we do, we'd probably have to include that in the RFP. Um, the downside of that is that neither site is probably going to have 40 to 50 units, which is the sweet spot that people talk about or the minimum size in order to attack, uh, to attract uh, community investment tax credits, which are the major way this kind of housing is supported. So it may be impractical to do, to sever the two sites for that reason. Um, I did have a note of love. Carol asked whether we have to have one building. The answer is no. Really, it's not up to us or it shouldn't be up to us. We can decide whether we want one building or two buildings or three buildings and put that in the RFP. But to quote, or at least paraphrase what Tom Kegelman always said to us when we were working on the E Street RFP, don't micromanage don't tie the developer's hands unnecessarily. Give them freedom and flexibility to create what think they think is the most appropriate use of the site. They're gonna invest much more in the way of resources, architects, landscape planners, engineers, uh, et cetera, in deciding how to use uh, both sites. And so honestly, given their likely experience, they're gonna be in a much better position to ultimately make these decisions. So we should try to avoid constraining the developer unnecessarily. It's gotta be really important to us to put a constraint in the RFP. Hi, John, and I'm so sorry that my technology failed me during the meeting, but in that same vein of thought, um, what is, is it part of the, CPA requirements that most units be um, at least two bedrooms, because I'm assuming that the, the number of bedrooms will impact both the size and the number of units in addition to the revenue that the developers will be working with. No, that's not a CPA requirement. When we designed the RFP for the East Street School, we wanted and this is a value judgment to uh, make most of the units or at least the affordable units available to families. And we chose a preponderance of two bedroom units primarily because when we were acquired of Wayfinders, um, we found that that's what their biggest waiting list was for Amherst property. So we thought that made sense but that's a value judgment. We don't have to do that this time if we don't want to. Because I'm thinking that instead of putting it as a minimum requirement that, you know, at least 50% of the units be two bedrooms that we can instead have it as a, the highly advantageous that more than 50% are advantageous. And then uh, instead of having it as a minimum requirement, just because we might be constricting the, the, the number of people that can see this as a feasible development. Um, just thinking about prior instances where that's happened with other projects I've worked on. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, nobody except the working RFP working group knows what you're talking about with respect to advantageous or highly advantageous. So we'll get to that a little bit later. So people get a, get a look at what you're talking about. Sounds good. Okay. I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay. So uh, the decision to combine the two sites into a single RFP is not set in stone. Um, although I have to admit my personal bias is in that direction. But if a majority of us think that's not the way to go, then we don't have to go that way. Um, okay. Uh, 
I guess when we talked about process, it's important to know that after we finish with the RFP, it's still draft. Um, it has to be reviewed by the town procurement officer who is uh, Anthony Delaney, and then it has to go to the town attorney, most likely Sharon Everett at KP Law. So there are things that they can change about it that are beyond our capacity. And in fact, as we go through the RFP, you'll see that there are things with we probably shouldn't bother with because they're boilerplate legal stuff or other things that uh, we shouldn't fool with. <laughs> At least that would be my sense. Um, okay. Uh, when we looked at the East Street School property and, and you can go back and see what the land looks like, there's almost like two parcels. There's a front parcel, which is where the school sits, that faces right on the E Street Common. And then there's a back parcel that's behind the school, behind it, and a little bit uh, to the south, actually, that has been a town recreation land um, for a long time. It was established by Stan Zomek, Dave's father, if you're curious, um, who was head of the DPW at the time and was very active, if you don't know, in town recreation leagues, particularly Little League Baseball and the like. Um, as head of DPW, he had his troops bring Phil onto that piece of property because it was a bit wet and that allowed it since to be recreation land. We cannot build on it because it is still wet, um, but uh, we can grandfather in the current use. And so that's likely what we would do. It's what we did with the original E Street RFP. Any questions about that? Oh, hey, John, this is Nate. Um... Yeah, I will say that I did. We did have the wetlands redelineated and surveyed, so uh, you know that's that'll be going to the conservation commission pretty soon. And so John is right that you know uh, if you look at the E Street School, the you know where the building is and in front of it is developable, but essentially behind it and the field is is not. So you know, although it is almost two acres, it's really about you know eight tenths of an acre is really the front lot, and that's what would be the focus of a developer. Okay, so now I had a list of the major sections, which is what we're gonna review. So I'm not gonna go over that list because we're gonna see them shortly. Uh, is there anything else that I had in that file, uh, John? Page um, down a little bit and see if there's anything else. These were the review, section by section review, which we're about to do. Um, yeah. And just in making sure that the criteria, the comparative criteria was right, uh, a part of the RFP because that is a very important part. Yeah, and, and we did incorporate that now into the main body. Okay, so let's switch over to the RFP. We'll kind of go through it section by section but where there's not much to talk about with respect to a particular section, we're just gonna skip through it. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, my, uh, my goal is for everybody at least to be oriented to what we're doing and particularly for people uh, who are here who aren't gonna be at our next uh, RFP meeting. Uh, if you have an idea or a thought please uh, weigh in and we'll take it into consideration when we meet. Hey, John, there's a, a, an attendee, I think it's Chad who has his hand raised. Can we? Sure. Yeah. All right, Mac user, you're- uh... Yeah, that's Chad. Yeah. Hello, Chad. I'm not sure if this is the right time. Uh, 
I had two questions and two points uh, of view to add. Do you want that at uh, this time or at the end? Um, it might be better at the end because, or, or Chad, if a particular point is related to something as we're going through it, that would be the moment to raise it. And then uh, there might be other points to raise other points in time, other concerns that you have. All right, if there's a vote, at least before that. Oh, I don't think there's gonna be a vote tonight, All right. Chad. All right, I'll wait to the end, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, moving right along, there's a front page uh, which has the town logo and a few other things. Um, skipping through that, obviously the cover page will be updated. Then there's this section uh, about the request for proposals and when things will happen and a little bit about the goals of the town. All of that gets changed after we've gone through and made the whole bunch of decisions we're gonna make. In fact, this could be the last, even though it comes first, it could be the last thing that's, that's actually uh, written. Okay, so we'll move on, John. And, uh, unless somebody had a question about that. Um, let's see. Anybody? Okay, we'll keep moving as you can see. Um, for the most part, uh, John or Rita has identified things that are gonna be changed in red. So any of the deadlines that are in here are still the old deadlines. Um, obviously all those are gonna be revised and those will be revised by Anthony. Okay, so let's keep moving down. Okay. Uh, it's typical for an RFP to provide background information, which are descriptions for the sites. We have the existing description for the E Street School site. At the moment, there's no description for the Belchertown Road site. I think there are a couple of things that we'd want to do now with respect to improving or changing the description of the E Street School site. We want to be able to tell a potential developer that there isn't a wetlands problem, uh, that we have done a survey and uh, an official survey, and there is nothing on the front piece of property that prevents them from using the entire piece of property as far as wetlands is concerned. There is a culvert at the back that's broken. Hopefully we'll fix that and we'll make reference to the fact that the town is gonna to fix that before we sign up a developer. And the other thing is the physical building. We need to do an analysis of hazardous materials. Nate already has a contract out, I believe. So it's only a question of getting the contractor to tell us what's there and then language about the school would also be included. So other than that, I think everything that's in there is probably pretty standard. Uh, a little bit about the history of the building, about what utilities, infrastructure is available, et cetera. And unless somebody wants to stop, um, we don't necessarily need to go over that. Okay, does anybody have more and John sorry just to jump in that you know the zoning on both properties right now wouldn't accommodate the types of design we're thinking about so I do think it is important in the zoning section to you know this would be a comprehensive permit project or two comprehensive permit projects so I, right. I do think that's important to note so you know uh, I don't think the town is going to try to add zoning or change zoning for either of these sites and so it really would be a comprehensive permit project. And so that is, you know, that, I think that is pretty significant for um, just to reference because. I think it's there, Nate. No, it, it is, it is. But I do yeah. think, I just want to, you know, I know John said, you know, it's 
we can go through these. I just wanted to point that out to the trust that it's not, you know, in some parts of towns, you know, like downtown, you know, mixed use buildings are allowed by right and you can get the density we might be looking for, but for these properties, we, it, you know, the zoning doesn't allow that. Yeah, I suspect Nate knew it was there because he probably put it there. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I mean, I think the town has a good rep. I, I mean, I think the town works really well with 40B projects. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see that as a barrier really actually, but. Yeah. Okay, then we come to a section on objectives and guidelines. Again, what you have are objectives and guidelines that were written two years ago um, that really only reflected what we decided to do with the East Street School property. Now we're gonna have both properties and we're gonna have to decide uh, what we want on Belchertown Road and uh, whether we wanna keep the same plan for the East Street School site or whether we wanna change it. The other thing that's in here that Rita might need, might want to say something about is uh, if you look, the second bullet says program use and design guidelines. There was almost nothing said about design guidelines in this document. And uh, I don't think that we're likely to produce new design guidelines for either or both of these sites. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a huge task. Two, it's something that uh, town council and the planning board are both working on. And so I don't wanna do something that would compete with what they're doing. However, and Rita can speak to this, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development has seven pages of design guidelines in the document that a developer will have to respond to. So we're probably at least going to want to assure any developer that we would expect them to be responsive to those design guidelines. Rita, do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, I just if you scroll down, I think we incorporated some language in that, but well, there you go. Um, so the, the Department of Housing and Community Development um, uh, publishes something called the Qualified Action Plan, and it is the guidance for developers using low-income housing tax credits, which we assume would be a major source of financing for this development. Within that Qualified Action Plan, which I think is it's well over a hundred pages. There is incorporated um, both general design guidelines, but then um, some criteria if you if you're building certain kinds of housing, like green housing or using um, uh, something called CBH, which is I think it's community based housing. I'm not entirely sure, but anyway that. So we thought we would reference those design guidelines here rather than try to replicate them, as John said, putting seven pages of design guidelines in here. Since we have an architect in the group, Francis, do you have any comment <laughs> on that? Um, well, like Rita said, the the QAP that DHCD puts together is is quite thorough. It lists you know minimum sizes. It now has um, a green building, both requirements and what they put as uh, suggestions for developers. And since it looks like uh, pending what uh, legal says, all of these will be um, non for profit developers. They should already be well versed. I think that both uh, the QAP in addition to the town's existing design guidelines should be enough. But again, this can be something that's that's from not advantageous to highly advantageous rating if we want something else. I know sometimes um, there's more, um, you know, we can rate projects higher if they have, um, if they're all solar or et cetera, et cetera, or by the way they, uh, they abide to the aesthetic of their surroundings, but I don't think we should, um, like you said, there's already a lot of work being done there. So I don't think we should add too much more on top. Okay, so we can go over them and decide whether or not 
we want to reference something specifically in the evaluation criteria, which will be coming to shortly. Okay, moving along. Again, we have decisions to make about what configuration of bedrooms we want. Um, and that's highlighted currently. Um, so uh, unless there's any comment or discussion about that. Okay, we'll move along. Um, the, the developers would be required to include a management and maintenance plan. And somebody, I can't remember whether it was Carol or Erica, asked the question about what happens related to potential eviction. And so we talked about that a little bit. One of the things we can do is look at the Somerville Housing Stability Notification Act, which we've talked about and see whether we wanna take anything from that to include as part of a required maintenance plan or management plan. I will say I sent you all a note a few hours ago. Um, well, maybe I should, I'll hold this for later in the meeting. I don't, I don't wanna confuse this. But I will say, John, I mean, at one point, you know, we could discuss whether or not we even make this a requirement of the RFP or if this is front loading too much. You know, do we ask for, or will we put in, you know, we could, have as part of the description that, you know, if, if this project were to move forward, you know, other future agreements would require certain things, you know, as part of the land development agreement or something, but maybe we don't include it here as a requirement up front. You know, we can always say that it would be a future requirement. It's just, you know, we're asking a lot of a developer to submit a proposal, you know, to develop a management plan. Uh, and, you know, they, they're not even going through permitting yet, so. Yep. I, I, yeah. What you remind me, Nate, you're absolutely right, is that basically we have two things to consider here. On the one hand, if we don't put something in that's really important into the RFP, we've lost our chance. This is it, folks. If we don't, if something's really important to us, from a value point of view, as much as anything else, uh, then uh, we got, it has to be in. On the other hand, as Nate was just saying, and as I said earlier, paraphrasing Tom Kegelman, we don't wanna tie a developer's hands if it's unnecessary to do that. So with that, I'll just, we'll just continue along. But I just say, I, I thought that when we were talking about this the other night, we talked about, yes, of course, we don't want someone to have to make a management plan, but if it's important, there's something about eviction in it, we can still say we would expect that whatever management plan you do present will have something like this in it. And also, as, as uh, Francis has been pointing out, there are lots of places where we can have things that are we would really like to see this happen. And if you do this, you'll get more points or whatever it is. And if you don't, it's okay, but you will be, you know, it will be less competitive or whatever those words are that I can't remember, less advantageous. Right. <laughs> uh, but so it's not like it doesn't, it didn't, at least when we were talking about it the other night, it didn't feel to me quite like an either or. Either we have to say, give us a management plan or we have to say nothing. There's room in between, it seems like. Very good point, Carol. Very good point. Okay, so John, can you move us along? Um, yeah, we're probably gonna lease, as I said, a 99 year lease. And there's a section we're not gonna go over that's an appendix, which is uh, a likely land development agreement that the town and the developer would sign once the developer has met certain conditions, um, having initially contracted to work on the property. Okay, again, these are all things that 
uh, are up for discussion. Uh, what are the affordability requirements that we want? As you'll see later, when we look at the old draft uh, uh, evaluation requirements, as Carol was just saying, and as Francis pointed out before, we have one set of things that we put in what's advantageous and what another set that we put in what's very advantageous. So we can continue to do that. Although it doesn't say that here, it does say that elsewhere. Okay, stop at the very beginning of this section. Yeah, okay, so um, we are gonna have evaluation criteria. They're really summarized here. Uh, there are two things that I pointed out to the drafting group that are important. One is anything that's important to us should probably be evaluated. And second, we'll come to a later section which describes what the developer must include in their formal proposal. And we wanna be sure to include anything or any information from the developer that we would need in order to do a proper evaluation. That seems obvious, but when you're actually doing the task, you have to be careful to make sure that you do follow through on that. Okay, so maybe we can skip down, uh, John, to the, uh, yes, to the comparative criteria. Okay, so here's what they were for East Street. And I'll say one thing in general about this before we start looking at the specific criteria. Um, and that is, we might consider having three of these columns instead of four. In looking at some new RFPs, they really didn't have four columns. They had an unacceptable column, an advantageous column, and a highly advantageous column. So that really, we don't need to talk about what's acceptable. Anything that is unacceptable is clearly unacceptable. And then beyond that, we can just do advantageous or highly advantageous. Rita reminded me that last time we kind of struggled uh, in order to complete both the acceptable and the advantageous columns, because sometimes it was hard to tell the difference. So, okay, here we are looking at what proportion of units need to be affordable at what level. And as you can see, there are, there's an indication about what would be unacceptable. Essentially, those are the minimum requirements. And then we have the advantageous, which is now I think gonna become our minimum requirements and highly advantageous is what we consider to be a better design. And from the developer's point of view, I think the main difference has to do with uh, financing, whether you can put the money together in order to meet the highly advantageous requirements. So John, I just wanna reinforce that this is what we were using for East Street School and that the subcommittee hasn't gone through this yet. Yes. So I assume the subcommittee will be reviewing all of these and then make coming back to the, um, to the trust with recommendations. So all of this, again, reflects that original RFP. Yeah. But again, if anybody has any concerns or any thoughts about what this could be, you can weigh in now, or you've got a copy of this, you can wait to weigh in at the next sub uh, drafting group when we meet. Or if you're not a member of that, you can weigh in when the larger housing trust meets because I think we'll go over some of this at each of our future meetings to show what the drafting group is recommending. Sure, John, I think, yeah. So I think for the other trust members, just to cut in here that, you know, the minimum criteria and then this comparative criteria, you know, John had mentioned what we'd want to have as values. And so if we're thinking you know, whether it's uh, unit configuration, sizes, affordability levels, design guidelines or things, this is where we could expressly state them and have them be comparative criteria. So 
Carol, you, you know, you had mentioned um, the, for instance, the management plan. So we could have something here that would, you know, we could figure out what our documents or other supporting things that could be part of a comparative criteria. Um, but just, you know, I think, you know, essentially this right here is, you know, really what the committee would use. So, you know, there'd be a committee of three to five people who would review proposals and they would use this criteria then to choose a developer based on everything that's submitted using, you know, this comparative criteria. So it's a, it's comparing the proposals. It's not, you know, and, and we're doing it, you know, there's no, the state uh, recommends not using numerical things here, but, you know, these qualitative uh, criteria. So it's a discussion amongst the, um, the committee. We could require an interview or ask for interviews of, of developers. And so really, if we think there's some really important things to have in here, it would be, you know, at least in the criteria and we can reiterate it earlier, you know, or have it stated earlier in the document. But if trust members, you know, like John said, if you think of something in the next week or two, uh, you know, just shoot, shoot myself an email, shoot me an email or John an email saying, you know, what, what if we could, is there a way we could incorporate, you know, this idea into this criteria or the minimum criteria? Yeah, there's one other thing I'll mention. People may be wondering, well, where's 80% AMI or 100% AMI in this? Uh, the reason we focus more on 60 or 50% AMI, as well as a few units at 30% AMI, is that in order to use a housing voucher in Amherst, a mobile voucher that might come through the Amherst Housing Authority, uh, these have to be set at least at 60% AMI. 80% AMI is likely to be too high. Um, now, uh, I will say in the development at 132 Northampton Road, uh, Valley Community Development did have some units at 80% AMI. They anticipated those would not necessarily be subsidized um, but would be paid for, I believe, primarily with the uh, income that people who are working and living in those units would have. Okay, so any issues with the numbers at this point? If not, we'll move on. Could I just, <clears throat> could I just clarify? I think what Nate just said I want to make sure that there's a way that people can make comments when they're not in one of these meetings without breaking some rule about uh, open meetings or something. So in this case, it's okay to email Nate or John with suggestions about something that should happen here, even though it's in between meetings. Is that true? Yeah, to be safe, just email me, email staff, and then I can, you know, forward it on to John or whoever's working on the RFP and just you know, don't copy the whole trust, just send it as an individual email to me. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. And okay. the working group can't email each other back and forth in between okay. meetings. We can only talk about it when we're actually meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay down to the next one. Developer track record. This is pretty standard. Um, I don't remember where we got this language. Rita probably found it somewhere. Um, we might look at some of the newer RFPs that are available to us and see whether anybody has any better language. Um, there was also one specific issue came up with another criteria to include under developer track record. I'm not remembering what it is offhand, but I think it's in uh, John's minutes of the meeting. So anyway, as I said, this is pretty standard stuff. Uh, we might look for ways to improve it when the drafting committee meets. Oh, I, it, it's track record on providing energy efficient housing. Yeah, okay. Actually, I think we may have moved that someplace else, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's where <laughs> that's, it is in my note from last yes. time. Yes, no, that's okay, Carol. Okay, keep moving down. Financial feasibility, basically the review committee needs to decide whether uh, the developer has demonstrated a feasible path to financing the project. 
So the developer has to say, here's where I expect to get money. And from the point of view of the evaluation committee, that has to make sense. John, uh, Chad has his hand raised if you want to call on him. Okay, or sure. Next time. Sure, Chad. Okay. I was just letting me know I'm still here waiting for the end. Oh, okay. Not quite to the end. No, we got a few okay. more evaluation criteria before we get to the end. Okay, keep rolling, John, please. All right. Projected schedule. We want to know that the developer isn't going to sit on this after they get the contract for a year or two before they do anything. And so we need to get a schedule from them. And we might even say, okay, we expect that by a certain such and such a date, you'll have submitted a proposal to the ZBA for a comprehensive permit and possibly include some other milestones that we expect them to hit. Okay, moving right along. I won't repeat myself. This is an open issue and the drafting committee will talk about it. Uh, okay, so now we do have some design criteria. Uh, and again, this is something that we need to talk about and to decide whether these are reasonable and realistic for one or both sites. I would say the building massing issue particularly came up in talking about East Street School um, because it's a neighborhood that really doesn't have, I think many or any three-story buildings at this point in time. So uh, mitigating size was an issue there and it will be again. Okay, here's our management plan. This is an area where, again, we can possibly add some language around what we expect the developer to do if someone, if they believe someone should be evicted. And what else do we have? Community support. Yeah, the developer should have some idea about how to be sure that they are developing a good relationship with the surrounding community, particularly the abutters. Um, as we know, all know, that was clearly an issue for 132 Northampton Road. And in the end, I thought Valley Community Development handled it really well. Um, so they have a track record for sure. And we would hope anybody else bidding would have a good track record. Okay, I keep stopping to see if anybody has anything they want else they want to say. Okay, um, for both of these development, the developer has to be uh, working within the constraints of fair housing law and regulations and assuring that there is equal opportunity to have an opportunity to rent. And again, a lot of this is uh, specified by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, they will review an affir affirmative fair marketing, fair housing marketing plan, and it must meet their criteria, whether it meets ours or not. John, if I can interject here. Um, I think we had talked about demonstrated experience in terms of ensuring that um, those who um, will have access to the information, because it's going to be a lottery system, um, come from very diverse communities, um, that they really have some sort of track record or experience or can demonstrate that they've been able to do that. Yeah, I got some suggestions actually in the last day or two 
um, from Shelley Gehring of MHP around that. So we could certainly do something that strengthens that a bit. I agree, Erica, it's a good idea. We're actually getting to the end of what we're gonna talk about. Ah, we're at the end of what we're gonna talk about. Um, oh yeah, all of this, we're now in a section which says, okay, here's what the developer has to include. And again, I don't wanna go over this now. After we finish the review criteria, then we make sure that we've included in a requirement for information for everything we need in order to be able to evaluate the proposal. Uh, last time the town manager appointed the review committee, it consisted of uh, Nate, Connie Kruger, and myself with Anthony Reynolds ex officio. Uh, for my money, it could have been a little bit larger, could have had a couple more people from the trust, but that's what the town manager wanted to do. If we want him to do something different, we can talk with him about that uh, the next time he's here. Okay. Then the rest of this submission is all boilerplate. I think um, that was our last, yeah, that was our last comment from the meeting. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go over the rest of it. You all have a copy of it. As I said, by and large, it's mostly stuff that would appear certainly in any RFP for affordable housing and often in any RFP by a state or local government. Um, so if you have questions about any of these sections, we can take them up at another meeting. Um, if So if you want to take the time to go over them. And again, if you have questions, uh, you can let Nate or I know or simply bring them up at the next meeting. Okay, Chad. Chad? You're mute, Chad. I, I was looking for the unmute button as it was before. At any rate, uh, this looks like uh, some great development since I've last been with you all. Um, as an ex-builder, I can really, uh, you know, congratulate you on the idea of economies of scale. Um, it reminds me of machines that, uh, you know, punch out a, a handle for a door for five different models of cars instead of one. And in the building trades, it's mostly about purchase of materials and storage. So if you're going to have these two places, it's going to be a hell of a traffic jam over there in, in that area. Uh, UMass uh, folks cut through uh, there quite a bit. Maybe you stage the stuff on the East Street Common or something. I don't know. But you can still treat these as two totally different buildings with totally different, uh, you know, purposes. Um, it, it's still going to get you that economy of scale. Um, hopefully they don't build them identical so they look identical, but... Um, that was one thing I was thinking of. The other was if uh, it's 800 square feet, isn't that eight 10 by 10 rooms or a 20 by 40 foot building? So that's a large apartment. Uh, you know, it's three quarters of a suburban tract house. Uh, so you think about who would live there. It gets to my second point the housing production plan and the other plan that uh, the town itself contracted said, we need 200 low income, not moderate, not the 80 and 100%, but down towards the 30 and less. Um, so I don't think that's going to be something that uh, the builder is going to build for, for a rent those folks can pay. Um, so we need 200 of those. We just had, what, 30 put up um, on the other end of town on, on the uh, Amherst College campus, or they're going to be put up. So that's still a long stretch, 70, 70 more low and extremely low income uh, places are needed. Uh, and then 
the last, well, two last things. One was uh, most places are getting away from the Ann Whalen type of, um, uh, you know, three, four, five story complex. Uh, it's shown to be somewhat dehumanizing. Um, things like uh, the little place I live in, for instance, uh, Chestnut Court. Um, things like uh, what's the Oaks up uh, to up, up towards the college, um, whatever that. Olympia. Olympia Oaks. Um, these are places that people want to live instead of a high rise. Um, so we have a high rise that's going in. Uh, on Northampton Ro uh, Road, and then we have two more here. Um, so there's some idea that you could consider other ways. Uh, you know, that makes uh, almost every single place um, of that style. And then the last one was item seven, Roman numeral seven. <laughs> they just left the capital T off trust. It's some red, um, it's a red, um, a red paragraph and it's under uh, black. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that at this point. Because you know, <laughs> we, we, we are we are the uh, affordable trust for the for the town. Um, you know, um, Francis and uh, Rita told us about what we can't change. Uh, what is set in stone, literally stone of a building. The builders uh, and John and, and Carol talked about where do we fit our morals and our values in here. You know, and. Uh, I think it comes up with the, uh, you know, under under 80%, the, the 30 to 50. We need to triage the people are most in need uh, first. Uh, anyway, that was, that was my comments. Thanks for the time. Okay, thanks, Chad. Does anybody else have any comments or any advice for the uh, drafting committee or drafting working group or whatever we call it? There's another hand in the attendees, Laura Baker, Laura hands Baker. up. I'd love to hear from Laura. Okay, Laura, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Laura. Hi, quick comments. Um, the difference between the 50% and 60% AMI tiers is not that meaningful. And I would encourage the trust to look at focusing on 30% and 60%. Um, just because it's it's a lot to manage so many different income tiers and it really isn't a significant difference in the population. Um, the other comment I have is as having been the, the only the sole respondent the last time this RFP went out, you know what's clear to me what was clear to me then and what's clear to me now is how much effort goes into preparation of this RFP. And I would just, make the trust aware and encourage the trust to follow through the proposal process. Because when we were trying to propose to the town, um, we really struggled. And I think, I just don't think it reflects how much people care about this. So um, there has to be a designated person who can um, answer questions if they're raised. None of our questions were ever answered when we raised them for the proposal. When we went for the site visit, no one had a key to the building. It's just, it was, it was not easy <laughs> to respond <laughs> and get information. And it, it's a shame because you're obviously putting a lot of work into crafting this document and someone has to hold it through that process. And it was obvious that there wasn't capacity to do that the last time. So I'd hate to see that same thing happen this time. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Laura. I don't know if we can do that, but Rita and I talked about the thought that uh, uh, we would ask that uh, one trust member, likely the chair, would be copied on any queries that came to the town. And so we would at least be aware of what the town was being asked and perhaps be helpful in responding. Uh, there may be other ways that Nate has in mind that uh, we can design it so that uh, trust members are a little bit more involved as we go through the process. No, John, I think that's good. Um, you know, I think, you know, typically, it's, you know, Anthony has all questions to him just so, 
you know, I think, but if you have, you know, if we're saying that we want to have someone or two people copied, um, you know, typically everything goes through the, you know, the procurement officer. Uh, I do think that, you know, for this time around too, I think, you know, there are questions, you know, mine are, you know, if we do combine the sites, you know, how do we apply the criteria? You know, the sites are different, the contexts are different. How do we apply some of the comparative criteria to those? And I think, you know, as the town and the trust, I think we have to just have, you know, we have to have some answers and we just, we, you know, whether or not the developer likes hearing them or possible developers, for instance, the culverts, John, I'm not sure the town is gonna fix the culverts. So, you know, for instance, if the town is not gonna fix the culverts on the E Street School property, so for those who don't know, you know, right behind the building, there's a culvert that carries uh, some water that goes under Main Street, you know, further down uh, past the property and it's been backed up for a while. And so it could be fixed. Um, and so, you know, my thought is if it's not gonna get fixed by the town, we just have to acknowledge it and just say it, you know, um, yeah. for instance, and the building, you know, I think another question was, is the town going to put a demo delay on the building? And, you know, for the E Street School, the building itself. And, you know, we haven't gone through that process yet. So either we start it or we just say that that's an unknown and we have to rely on a developer to, you know, to know that, so that for that risk. And so same with the Route 9 property, there's two houses on the property. You know, it's three properties, it'll become one site. So again, you know, what are the options for those buildings? And so, you know, I think there are things to think through because, you know, what happened with E Street before, you know, Valley and others who were looking at it had questions and the town didn't have, we didn't have all the answers and we didn't, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, whether or not Anthony sent them around or we, you know, it was forwarded around, even if they were, we may not have had the answers ready. You know, we may not have known what to say. And I think, I think we should have, you know, try to preempt any of those questions and, or at least consider what they could be and have an answer ready. You know, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we've looked at it enough now, but, you know, for instance, if I know, you know, for the Route 9 properties, for instance, you know, there's been discussions like, could a house be moved off site to provide more affordable housing? Or is it just going to be demolished? Or how could it be reused? And, you know, is that something we're going to put on the developer? Or is that something the town's going to undertake? And I think those are questions that we really should, you know, we can discuss as as a trust and then you know staff need to look at too before this rfp goes out because i think there's probably you know each each of the sites have their own own possible issues or you know challenges and it'd be nice to consider what are some ways to address them if, if they're asked so i agree i think we put a lot of work in and laura's right and then we ask a lot of the developer and so it'd be nice to make sure we have a clean process you know, listening to you, Nate, I'm thinking maybe we could identify a consultant who has some development experience, um, but is not uh, going to bid on this to review the RFP and say, here are the questions I would ask. Uh, you know, here are the things that look ambiguous to me. Here are the things that ideally would be included in this draft before you finish up with it. Uh, that might be a way of seeing things that we wouldn't see by ourselves. Yeah, I mean, or we, or we make a blanket statement that all, you know, that the developer, you know, basically assumes all, all encumbrances on the property and they deal with them. And then we, you know, we, you know, I, I mean, there's probably a few ways to deal with it. I just want to make sure we all consider it, you know, because they all have, that, you know, they present different challenges or they might affect the timeline or budgeting differently. And so, you know, for instance, I'm still not sure what, what would happen with the E Street School building if someone wanted to tear, tear it down. You know, right. is that something the historical commission really does not want or, you know. Well, let's see what the hazardous materials assessment has to say. And then as a friend of mine used to say, we'll jump off that bridge when we come <laughs> to it. Yeah, so the team has been in there. So they have taken samples, I will say, for the school. So we're just waiting on results. So they, are, they, they were in there last week, this week, last week. OK, great. That's good news. Any other questions or comments? OK, then we're probably ready to move on 
to our next item of business. Um, I hope this was a useful discussion for folks. Um, and as I said, we'll come back to it, although we're probably only focused on sections where uh, the working group, RFP working group, has specific things to recommend and will want feedback from the full trust membership. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm looking at my copy of the agenda. And the next thing I believe has to do with evictions. And I've got a few items under evictions. Uh, but the first one is a report from Janet Tetro. And uh, actually, I sent everybody a copy uh, of the report that Jana sent to me. She's so, here, John. She's yeah, No, no, I knew she oh, was okay, here. Good. Okay, good. I was just saying, this is what we're doing next. I don't think Jana needs any introduction at this point. So I'll let her go forward. I was just thinking, it's like your old friends. Hi, everyone. It's another <laughs> month and you're all your faces on Zoom. Um, well, uh, so I know you have a lot of things on the agenda, so I don't want to belabor this report. And hopefully you've seen some of, got seen some of the data that I sent to John earlier in the week. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, you know, I think we continue to, uh, applications definitely have slowed down a little bit. Uh, we get, I think this week we've gotten three um, our processing speed obviously has increased as a result of that because there's fewer applications. Um, we continue to get a lot of applications from people who don't live in Amherst. And so that um, it does sort of skew our data. I was thinking after I sent this to John and John's comment back was, wow, the approval rate is really low. And I, I went back and I was, I realized, you know, it is, I mean, it does look low on these, these charts. And part of it has to do with, I'm including the ineligible people and the withdrawn people who don't even really make it to the place where they would get reviewed. So I did go back um, and looked at, you know, sort of took those back those numbers out just to give you a little bit of a better idea. So of the 226 total applications between round one and round two, if I take out all the ineligible, incomplete and withdrawns, we go down to 94 applications. So those are the ones that got actually look, looked at or in the process of being looked at. And so then the approval rating is about 38%. So, you know, perhaps not what we expected it to be, but um, it does, it's a little bit better than 16%, which is what it looks <laughs> like when I include all of those other people. So um I think that's an error in the way that I presented the data to you. So it's a little bit better than that. Um, I thought it might be helpful. I think you had asked me this before, but to maybe give you an example or a couple examples of folks that have been helped. Um, and one thing that's really changed, I would say in the last two months is a real increase in coordination with other providers. So community legal aid um, as a result of some uh, new money that's been available to them has hired some case managers um, to really work with folks um, from the notice to quit stage, helping them apply for financial assistance. Um, and also we've um, been doing a lot more coordination with wayfinders around raft. And so um, one sort of success story, I think, is we have a we have an applicant in the Amherst program. Um, I won't give too many personal details, but they are a household of four. They do not speak English. They speak a language um, actually other than Spanish. So we've had to use the language line quite a bit. Um, and their household of four, they actually lost their income uh, prior to started. Well, they were an Uber driver who lost their income during COVID, but prior to that had also been having difficulty paying their rent. And so they have not been eligible for the CDC moratorium on evictions because their rent issues started before COVID. Um, and there's some stipulations about that CDC moratorium. You have to actually be paying, at least trying to pay part of your rent during the period. And they've been having a real, real hard time. Um, so they have been working with uh, the case manager from Legal Aid. So they 
have applied to the Amherst program. They've applied to RAFT. They're working with legal aid. Um, we're actually assisting them with some other funds that we have because they owe about $15,000. Um, they owe a lot. But because they're eligible for the COVID raft, they can get some help with monthly rent going forward. But Wayfinders wanted sort of some more assurances that some of these other, they couldn't cover the whole thing with what they were eligible for from Wayfinders. So we've been able to sort of cobble together, I think three or four different programs to keep them housed um, with also some help with uh, figuring out some other employment opportunities going forward. So I think they're also working with Family Outreach of Amherst on some other employment opportunities. Um, so that's been uh, a lot of work for our staff um, and all the folks involved, but it's been a lot of coordination. So it's been, I think it's, you know, it's been good to see some of that kind of all come together. Um, and we're hoping that that's gonna get resolved pretty soon because they're already in court in violation of an agreement that they signed a long time ago. So they've been, they're farther along in the process than most of our other applicants because their issues started before COVID and then continued through COVID. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about the data or any other questions you might have about how things are going. Carol? Um, I'm just curious about, so 38% in the way that you did the, the stuff that is better, eliminating the people who are all obviously ineligible, what about the other, whatever the difference is there? What about what are the usual re or what are some of the kinds of things that make people not be eligible if they're in Amherst and blah, blah? Um, so the two biggest reasons why people have been denied is um, they don't have a COVID related loss or reduction in income um, and or they have sufficient income and or assets to pay their rent going forward. So these were the sort of criteria that was set up by the town. And, um, you know, John had asked me, well, what are some things that we could change? Um, and, uh, you know, the COVID loss and reduction of income, you know, it is tied to the CARES Act and being reimbursed by CARES. And I know that that's, you know, an in, in, of interest to the town. Um, RAFT is really loosening up what they are willing to accept as a COVID reason. And I don't know how, I mean, they, I think, have CARES money too. So I'm not really sure how DHCD is, is sort of dealing with that. But um, across the state, RAFT has seen an enormous number of people with incomplete applications, and they're really trying desperately to get people approved. Um, but the sufficient income and assets to pay your rent, you know, we have this formula that looks at their income and their assets and their rent and um, and that knocks people out. They just, it turns out you know, that they, looks like they can't afford it. And so then they become ineligible. Um, I will say some of those folks, we end up helping with other funds that we have that don't have those stipulations. So, and so it's not as if they just get, you know, sold goodbye, we can't help you. We try to help them with other sources if we have it, but um, that's been, those have been the two barriers. But I think quickly on the asset piece, we're only asking for bank statements. So we're not asking right. to see retirement or any other, you know, any other portfolios. And we're not asking them to spend all their assets. So, right. you know, I agree there's a formula, but we're saying, you know, it's like if half your assets can help out with the rent, then, you know, you, we would expect that they would contribute a little bit from their bank account to rent. And so, you know, that's why we have it in there. Um, you know, we're not saying that they need to drain their bank account, but you know, it's sometimes you might find a household that's not making any rental payments, but then they have, they have a fair amount in their bank account. And it's like, well, why aren't you, or have you tried to make, you know, partial payments or work with a landlord? And so um, I think that's a, you know, it, it's a local decision. It's, it, you know, it's a, but it is, you know, it's something that if this were being paid with block grant money, it would be a requirement. And so CARES, and now it's no longer CARES, it's actually trust money. I think the CARES money ended as of December 31st. So um, CARES had actually had some provision, small provision in there about um, income eligibility. But uh, yeah, I guess one question I had also in addition was if the number withdrawn, why do you think people are withdrawing? Is it, you know, is it the lag in getting, you know, communication between community action? Are they, do they think they're ineligible? Because it's a fair amount of people who are with withdraw. So I, I, 
you know, and, and, and I'm assuming they're not duplicate entries uh, compared to people who have incomplete applications. So the withdrawn are separate than incomplete. That is true. Um, so I'm just looking at the, because I tracked the reasons. So a couple of them um, didn't want to, you know, we, they thought we asked too many questions. Um, they had roommates that didn't want to provide their information. Um, some people are like, they apply, but they're like, oh, but I'm moving next month. So we're like, okay, well, so they withdraw because they're, but a couple of people that were moving, um, one ended up resolving the issue on her own after she, we contacted her for an appointment. Um, so it's a little, you know, it's a little bit of a mix. Yeah. I'm not going to read these, um, but I did send you a note about a variety of things that are happening on a state mostly and a little bit on a federal basis with respect to trying to do eviction prevention. And one very significant piece of that are changes that DHCD made as of this Monday. So mm -hmm. it's very fresh still in the RAFT program. And for the most part, they look good. Some of them don't look that consequential. Some of them look like they might be important. Um, they are doing some things to, tr uh, to try to speed the process. For example, they are allowing uh, their regional administrative agencies to look at uh, DTA data, that's data on uh, probably what we used to call aid to uh, families uh, or looking at uh, eligibility data um, for uh, mass health. And if they look eligible in those files, then they don't have to submit any income data. That's, that's a done deal. If those files aren't available, then they still have to go ahead and submit some kind of income data. But so there is a number of things that uh, DHCD has done to try to streamline the process in principle. In practice, my understanding is they're still way backed up uh, and there is still a major log jam uh, across the state and for uh, many of the agencies that are administering the program. Hopefully that all gets resolved in another month or two. DHCD has given agencies money to hire additional staff. They're having a lot of online training. Um, they have a center that can respond to questions. So they're trying to do what they can to get rid of the log jam and to streamline the process. Um, and I, one of the things I asked Jana, is there anything that uh, is happening with the RAF program, any changes that we might consider with our local program? And I don't know what the answer is, Jana, but I'm asking again. Um, you know, I think they're right. So they're they're loosening up what they consider a COVID reason. As far, what's my understanding from the RAF staff that I've spoken to is they're really loosening up what a COVID reason is. It doesn't have to be a demonstrated loss of or reduction in income. They can, you know, it can be an increase in inspection expenses. It can be, you know, something else. Um, and they are they're being much looser on what they people will provide for income. I mean, I think they're taking self certifications. Um, they have wage match, you know, access that community action doesn't have. They can access DTA and other data sources to try to wage match, but they're also, you know, really trying to be creative in what they'll allow folks to accept. So, you know, that I'm not recommending that the town do that, but I, I mean, I think, you know, potentially loosening up COVID reason could be one thing. Um, the staff asked me to bring to the meeting um, if we could extend the assistance for longer than three months. 
Um, we have at least one current recipient who the landlord called and asked if we could do another three months and extend it to six months. Yeah, we agreed so, to that at our last meeting. To extend it to six months? Yes, well, I believe we that, did. I thought we'd agree that if they applied in round one, they could reapply in round two. I, I think that's a little different than saying that they could get six months of assistance, right? Or, I knew about the where you could reapply for round two, and we have had people do that. Um, but this, yeah, this is a request to have like six months of assistance. Um, I thought that's what we agreed to at our last meeting. Uh, I remember Paul saying distinctly, we need to get the money out there. And I think that was certainly important to me, and it probably was important to other people. Uh, so I think we did have an agreement last time that we would allow people to go up to six months of uh, payment if they were eligible for that. They obviously would have to reapply, but since a lot of the documentation was already provided, it would be a simpler reapplication re process. Yeah, that's, that's how I remember it, that if somebody, even if somebody already having gotten the money didn't exclude them from applying again. So they could, that, that, that's what I thought. Right, so they could said. receive so up could, to six months of assistance. Right, so they could go with, for, they could go for a second time. Yeah. So whether they were coming from round one to round two or they were Who, in whatever, round two yeah, and whoever. then, okay. Yeah, okay. right. It didn't matter about rounds. It just mattered about, okay. that's what I remember. We could go back and look at you at the minute say, I don't, that's what I thought I voted on. Yeah, John shaking his head yes, so he's in agreement. Or for more fun, we could just watch the Zoom meeting on YouTube. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, originally the three months though was considered, I don't know if that's CARES, but typically that's what's considered temporary. So, you know, longer than three months usually triggers maybe other requirements for funding, either in terms of auditing or other things. So keeping it at three months and then having them reapply, I don't know, maybe that's safe, but usually if it's more than three months, it's not considered temporary. So. You know, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what that means now, but I know initially CARES, that's three months was the maximum. So they were saying a three month, you know, because that's, that's considered temporary assistance. So like for block grant and others, that's what it is. Um, but now we're off CARES funding. Now it's our money. Yeah, so yeah. we can look. And do we think, uh, Janet, do you think that, um, you said it slowed down, but I guess at one point we thought there'd be more, maybe with the evictions and other things looming that we'd see an uptick anticipating that in the next month or so or is that i feel like i've been wrong about yeah, every prediction surprised. i've made <laughs> <laughs> well i have two pieces of data regarding that or maybe three one is i believe that i heard at uh pamela schwartz's last meeting that there were 180 evictions in the pipeline in hampshire county which isn't a huge number and then I followed up with her source, who I'm, his name I'm forgetting, um, but I found there were only four evictions in the pipeline for Amherst, the town of Amherst, which is pretty small. On the other hand, I was on another call today uh, that was sponsored by uh, Neighborhood Works, which is a raft administrative agency, I believe in the Southeast coast and an attorney who doesn't work for them but works for legal services said that she has good reason to believe that a lot of landlords are holding off on filing new evictions because they're uncertain about exactly what the environment's going to be about the effect of new state legislation uh, about the effects of the change in uh, federal legislation and so they aren't going forward right away. And that's been one explanation why we haven't experienced, and this isn't just us, but statewide, the tsunami of evictions that everybody was anticipating mm -hmm. after the governor's moratorium ended. So that's the best I can do on that. Uh, I was gonna say, I was all- Yeah, no, I was gonna say, John, I think that, um, the town had heard that there may be evictions happening with one property management company. And so I, I reached out to them and there were a few tenants they were discussing. And so then, you know, I, I asked if, um, 
you know, if they would be willing to work with the tenants and they said, yeah, so after over the course of two weeks between emails between different parties, uh, you know, so most of those tenants were then able to be reached and agree to, you know, a payment plan or work out with the landlord. So it is, I mean, I almost feel like it's both goes both ways, right? So the landlord is hesitant and a tenant who may not be making payments. Some are not coming forward to ask for partial payments or a payment plan and they're, they don't want to make themselves too visible. So they're maybe not seeking assistance, but it was interesting when, you know, someone facilitated a discussion that they could reach an agreement. So, you know, I think it is, a, it is a lot of work. And so maybe, you know, whether it happens recently or soon or, you know, further down the road, I think that there will be a lot of, you know, a lot of work that's needed to, you know, to resolve all the tenancy issues because there, there's still probably, you know, there's still going to be back rent or missing payments and leases will expire and landlords will, you know, at some point they're, you know, they'll, they'll issue notices. Um, so, you know, the one I you know, you know, the one company I worked with, they, they were willing to not work issue notices if, if they could get conversations going and, mm -hmm. and they held to it, which was good, but. Um, yeah, if people look at the attachment that I sent out, as I said, a few hours before the meeting, there are changes in state statute that are now gonna require landlords to not only put out notices to quit, but include the other, other kinds of information with that, that for example, were required by Somerville as part of its Housing Stability Act, and also to send a copy of the notice to quit to the state. Uh, so all that's now required as of, I think December 29th or whenever the legislature passed the budget, because I believe the things I'm talking about were all part of the budget language for the fiscal year that we're currently in. The legislature just got that budget passed six months after they're supposed to. Uh, anyway, uh, so things are in turmoil, honestly, with respect to the eviction prevention programs. Things are changing in a positive direction. I think you'll see that if you look at the note that I sent out, and Jana, my apologies, I didn't send it to you, I realize. Um, but uh, uh, in the meantime, there's a lot of adjusting that the system's going to have to do uh, before everything settles in. Uh, I'll just mention one other thing. Uh, I think on maybe Tuesday of this week, I got a note from Evan Ross and Evan was interested in sponsoring a, uh, a housing stability act based on what Somerville has before the Amherst town council. And he sent me a draft of it. Really it's a partial draft and asked me kind of what I thought or asked me to do some editing of it. And this was all before I started to look at what the state has done. And so I ended up sending Evan a note this afternoon saying, well, it looks like what the state is doing at least on a temporary basis, that is as long as this crisis continues, is a lot of the things that we would want in a local housing stability act. And I know when we talked about this in our group at our last meeting, people were somewhat concerned about that particularly about fines and uh, one other element of it that I'm not recalling. So what I suggested to Evan is that he and I should talk, but maybe it made sense to wait a few months and see what happens with the state's effort mm -hmm. to try to do this before we wanted to make the town go forward with this independently. So that was my response to Evan. Um, again, we can talk about this more, but again, if you look at the note I sent out, you'll see that the uh, legislation, particularly legislation that was par passed as part of the Budget Act, um, really included these kinds of requirements that landlords had to notify tenants, uh, not only the uh, uh, notice to quit, but also include information about their rights, about where they could seek help, 
and one or two other things that I'm not recalling off the top of my head. There was record sealing also for no fault evictions. Yep, that, that one's not a done deal yet, Will. Well, it, it actually, I think it just got signed. Oh, did the governor sign it today? About an hour ago. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, it was part of the community development bond bill and the eviction ceiling is included in that. So Will's quite right then, if the governor signed it, that's also a done deal, which is a very good thing. Um, I think I referenced an article that was written by a UMass student named Tim Scalona. I don't know if anybody saw it. It originally appeared in the Boston Globe and it was a reflection on his experiences as a kid when his family was evicted and how devastating that experience was for him and for the rest of his family. So eviction is a big problem. Not that I think I need to tell this group that, but if you have <clears throat> access to what Tim Scalona wrote, uh, it, it, it definitely, you know, is pretty emotional. It's a very strong statement. Actually, Tim is now the uh, student trustee for UMass. Um, and part of his, uh, you know, portfolio with, uh, with the uh, board of trustees is about, um, you know, housing security for, for students, not just at UMass Amherst, but for, for the system in general. So he's a great, great advocate. Great, so that's good to know. Yeah. Um, if, uh, Erica? Um, so I was just trying to check about uh, the CARES Act because uh, supposedly the CARES Act use of the funding was extended till next year, till December. But what I just saw is that the Treasury Department is has just or has $25 billion to assist uh, in emergency rental assistance and states could apply for it. The application date was the 12th of this year. Um, but under the criteria, it actually says that um, you could get this assistance as a rentee up to 12 months and it could be applied to another three months. So I was just wondering, how is it that the CARES Act only um, limits it to three months? I don't know, Erica. I can send, yeah. uh, my suspicion is yeah, I, it's the old CARES Act that had that limit. The new CARES Act, which was just passed by Congress may be what you're describing. And states have yet to see the money, although I think Massachusetts is gonna get $457 million or something like that. Although individual counties or cities do have some uh, right to apply themselves for that money. And that's as much as I know, I think it'll be a while before the town of Amherst settles in on exactly what it's eligible for and what it can do with that money. So you may be 100% correct. It's just going to take a while to settle. John? I was just going to say that I did double check. And we said simply to, we voted to expand the emergency rental assistance program to offer a second disbursement to any applicant who had previously applied. But I guess the question remains, did we let people know that they could do that? But that is at least what I had recorded that we voted on. Well, now Jana can let people know. Well, we did let people know who had applied, originally those who from round one that, that applied in round two, we told were ineligible. And we did tell all of those people that they were now eligible. And a couple of them actually did, we did process their applications. Um, but so what I guess I wasn't interpreting that is that we could also for round two people, if they could reapply for another three months. And that sounds like what they also can do. So we at least have one person that's interested in that. And I will let the staff know. So okay, good. Um, I won't say we've exhausted the discussion of eviction prevention, because there's a lot more that we could conceivably talk about. Um, but we do have a couple of other items, not many items actually, that are um, to go to. Are there any questions about either the note that I sent out or anything else that we've been talking about related to eviction prevention? I think, John, well, one thing with Jana here, we've 
I still have to extend your contract, but we had said we check back in in March, right? Is that what, yes. we, what we agreed to? Through I March? So I think we, it, we talked about extending the contract till June. Oh, right. Like June, right, right, okay. Right. Um, and then for the eviction one, John, I think um, I mean, that's another topic, but I think our, you know, is the trust going to recommend something to council? Is that, you know, what we want to have happen now or at a, fu a future meeting? Is that, you know, like you said, there are a few different things that are happening, but are you looking specifically for a proposal from the trust or recommendations to the council or? Well, I'm not necessarily looking at that. I did want to report back the email conversation I had with Evan Ross mm -hmm. and note that Evan contacted me first and asked whether we were interested in seeing Amherst adopt some version of Somerville's Housing Stability Act. And as I said, it I think was ambiguous when we talked about it. We talked about um, being able to implement the parts of it that were voluntary, which is to say to ask people to do the things that Somerville required, but do it on a voluntary basis and not include fines. So we were talking about doing that, possibly making a proposal to town council on that basis, but I feel like events have overtaken us. Uh, you know, as I said, the, the state has now said they're gonna do all that on a temporary basis. And so my personal predilection is to wait and see what happens with the state action. Um, but we can also go ahead and tell Evan, we're interested in having this discussed by town council and have town council move forward with the local ordinance. So to answer your question, Nate, I think it's open. Yeah. And people can weigh in one way or the other right now or at our next meeting or whatever. I was just going to say, um, I did get in touch with Emma Dragon, um, the health director, and um, she included Nancy Gilbert, those before the holidays. And they said, you know, let's connect after the holidays. I re-emailed them, but haven't really heard much back. And I think it's probably because Emma is full force doing vaccination clinics. Um, <laughs> so I haven't heard anything because I think it was suggested um, that we check in with the Board of Health to see if they wanted to partner with us to do something. Um, so I really have nothing to report, um, but I will if uh, once I do. Okay. Well, we can take it up with them after I get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts about what the town might do for eviction prevention at this point? Okay, well, we'll hold it off for at least a meeting and I'll see what I get back from Evan and report on that at our next meeting. All right, I'm uh, gonna say good night. I think unless you, I think you're done with me, right? Yes, I think we are, Janice. All Thanks right. very much. I appreciate right. your report. All right, I'll see you next time, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, oh, I have one thing to add before you leave. Oh, I yeah. was trying to figure out what the raft rates of approval are. Oh. And it's hard to tell from the data that's available, but to the extent that you could make any sense of it, my guess is it's probably between 20 and the 38% that you gave. If you yeah, just... you know, I had, uh, I can, I have some notes from a recent meeting I had with um, Wayfinders. I can say it's there, they were, I think 80% of the applications were incomplete. So I think that their approval rating was pretty low. I think their denial rating is, they claimed was very low. I don't know how true that is, but they claimed their denial rating was very, very low. But um, I can try to get those statistics. We meet with, we have a eviction diversion meeting uh, every like six weeks or so. So I can try to find out. Okay. Well, I may, may ask DHCD. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, okay. Shannon. Bye. Have, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you too. Okay, so we've managed to go through the two main areas of business. Um, okay, so we're up to update on state legislation. Will's already given us one very important update. Is there anything that you wanted to add at this point? 
Um, well, there were a few things about the economic development bill that I wanted to talk about, but now that it's signed, it's not particularly uh, relevant, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but there's, there's one thing uh, that is, I saw at the, uh, uh, the Western Mass uh, Coalition and Homelessness or Network and Homelessness, um, they had posted about signing on to the, uh, let's see if I can spot it. Um, Sending on to the uh, National Low Income Housing Center's letter to the Biden and Harris administration, uh, asking them to extend the federal eviction moratorium as well. Um, the deadline to do so is tomorrow. Um, and I think the question for the trust is whether or not we as an organization want to sign on to that effort. Um, so it's, yeah, that, that, that's one thing. It's pretty, pretty quick ask too. But um, other than that, I mean, I think with the signing of the economic development bill, there's not much not much more to report. Not much else pending at the moment with the legislature. Right. Well, I like the idea personally of saying that we support extending the CDC moratorium beyond January 31st. And the last time I needed to do something like that, Pamela made it pretty easy. It was simply a matter of uh, using a link to go to a website to say who we are and to say we we support extending it. Yeah. So yeah, and that's basically what this is as well. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy, straightforward. Uh, yep. So is there a motion for yes. us? Do it. <laughs> and is there a second? <laughs> okay. So we need to do a roll call. I second. Uh, and uh, if it's all approved, then Will can go ahead and do that on our behalf. So uh, I vote yes. Erica? Yes. Carol? Yes. Will? Yes. Francis? Yes. Sid? Yes. And Rob? Yes. OK, great, great issue. I'm sure there'll be other things coming before us. But I think the legislature did a pretty good job related to housing in the last month or so. Uh, we got a lot of things that were pretty important, uh, not the least of which in the economic development bill was half a million dollars for Amherst, 250000 to go to the affordable housing trust with no requirements and $250,000 to the town for a development that has to be LEED certifiable. I don't know what will happen to that one. We'll see. We're going to find a developer who's willing to do lead silver or gold, John. That's I... <laughs> what we have to do. <laughs> OK. So what else did I promise to do? Uh, yep. Nate put in two items that are probably brief. We finalized the changes to the trust strategic plan, I believe, in our last meeting. So that was the easy part. The hard part is going over the new things that we added and decided when and how we're going to try to get those done. Uh, as I thought about introducing this at this meeting, I said, nah, I want to give most of our time to the RFP. And it may be that for at least the next two meetings, it's also going to be difficult to get to this until we have resolved all the issues about drafting the RFP. So my inclination is to delay discussion of the things that we added. Not that I don't think they're important, but that I'm concerned that they are going to take a fair amount of discussion. So one of the items that I remember is, for example, finding new sources of financing for trust initiatives, which is a big one. Uh, and then there are other things as well. So my inclination is to postpone for at least a couple of months. But if someone disagrees, then I will put it on the agenda for the next meeting. So I don't hear for the summer. Yeah, I just put it there for that reason too, just so we don't forget about what we said we wanted to do. And uh, I agree, there's you know some pressing things now, but 
Okay. The other thing that Nate mentioned is that the Community Resources Committee is now hard at work on drafting a larger town policy on housing, which goes beyond affordable housing, at least affordable housing when you're talking about 80% AMI and goes to higher levels or what some people would call workforce housing. It's a little bit of an odd term, but nonetheless, I haven't heard another term that anybody's used uh, to characterize a population of people who are working, um, but for whom housing in town is not affordable. So they've made significant progress. They've incorporated a lot of the things that were actually in the housing trust proposal. Um, uh, but they still have a ways to go. While I like a lot of what they've included personally, the proposal to date is still a bit ragged. And so again, given the fact that I think the RFP is the most important thing we're working on right now, I'm not inclined to bring that to the trust for at least another month or two. And I did tell Mandy Jo Haneke, who's chair of the committee, that that's what I thought would happen. On the other hand, I did take an action, which I believe has been successful, to make sure that we do have our oar in as they go along working on this draft. And that is, I strongly encouraged Mandy to include Tom Kegelman as a full member of the process for developing this housing plan. Uh, and I believe that she and the Community Resources Committee have agreed to do so. I heard that from Dave Zomek today. I haven't heard it from Mandy or Tom, but I think that's what is gonna happen. And so I think if we have Tom represented in the process, um, that's a very good thing. And I think it gives us some breathing space before we take up a, a draft that they're working on. Uh, I can circulate the draft. So if anybody wants to see it, I'll do that. I don't want to hold it back exactly. But I think, I, again, unless somebody disagrees, I'm not quite prepared to put it on our agenda immediately. No, John, I, yeah, that'd be good if you could send the draft around. So, you know, I, one reason too, I put this on for the Housing Trust, I was going through, um, you know, the planning board is discussing 40R more now. I'm not sure they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll push to have it be adopted in town, but the CRC was discussing that and John presented the, the policy a few months ago, but the CRC and now the planning board are also talking about the housing policy. So it's something that, you know, we, the trust brought forward a year ago, or I don't know, maybe more than a year ago, but now it's, now they're trying to actually, you know, get something adopted. So John, I'm glad you reached out to Mandy Joe and we can have, you know, the trust can review it at some point in the future. I don't think we have to be, I think the CRC, right, is still trying to work on what they think are um, revisions they want. And then the planning board is looking at it on their upcoming meeting or two. So I just wanted the trust to be aware of it because, you know, there is the affordability component, but then there is just, you know, what is, you know, I think they're, you know, the policy is going to have implications for both um, housing production. So zoning changes, you know, maybe bylaw changes, it'll have, you know, could have a number of, 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 you know, kind of actions that need to be taken, even things the trust might do to help for the policy. So I just, you know, I just wanted the trust to be aware of it. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely, Nate. And I will uh, circulate the existing draft um, given where they are. Um, I will say also, as far as the Community Resources Committee is, it's working on both zoning and the larger town housing policy. And I think that means there's a lot of competition between those two things for their time. And zoning is likely to come before housing, although I can't be sure of that. I think Mandy Joe wants to get both moved along, but I think she has a priority for zoning over housing. So any questions about that? Okay, then 
Um, I guess we're ready to wrap up. Is there any public comments that we haven't heard? Any items that weren't on the agenda that somebody wants to raise? Okay, I'll mention one other thing, which was in one of the notes that I sent to y'all. Oh, There's a maybe. hand up in the public oh. people. Yeah. Yeah, Chad, if you unmute yourself. There yeah, I, I'm sorry, John. Um, it's late. I, I had my hand up back when you were talking about um, what's his name bringing in the um, Somerville Ordinance. Um, just like, uh, you know, education is a right now, um, health care and so on. Uh, Massachusetts has housing as a right. Whether you uh, own a mortgage or whether you're a renter, you cannot be kicked out of your home. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but um, it's been set in by precedent in the court of law, mostly through right here in Springfield. Uh, don't leave. Uh, what's, what was the name of that organization that, during the Great Recession? Uh, nobody leaves. Yeah, Springfield, no one leaves. No one leaves. Yeah, yeah. still exists. So, so yeah. the, the main point, I mean, again, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Uh, the main point to remember is in that ordinance, it says, and tell them their rights, because it is now a right. Housing is a right in the state. That's just uh, one thing I wanted to say. I've been on both sides of it as a tenant and a landlord. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I couldn't get a guy out of my house. In fact, that's how I lost my house. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks, uh, Jay. Yeah. All okay. Right. Yep. The, the last thing I wanted to recall back to your attention is, again, I sent this note out. There are a number of seminars or webinars or presentations that both CHAPA and MHP are sponsoring that relate to affordable housing this month and next month. And I provided the list and the dates and the topics uh, to everybody. I could send it out again. Um, I didn't provide the links for registration. Uh, if you go to either the CHAPA or the MHP website, you can probably find, almost certainly find the links there. Um, since they cooperate, you may be able to find the links for both the CHAPA and the MHP programs. So I would urge you to take a look at those. There are a variety of things that I'm trying to get to. Uh, I missed something today because I went to the Southeast Coast event instead, in which I learned a lot of important stuff about what's going on with eviction. But I was still sorry that I missed it because I think Chapa had an introduction to 40B and I felt like, well, that would be useful for me. I, I kind of know what 40B is, but I've never heard a systematic presentation and discussion of it. So I miss that. Although a lot of these things are being recorded, they will be available online later. And I'll try and find out about that and send information around about those recordings. So okay, I think- John, Just quickly, yeah, for members, if some of those have registration fees, uh, you could pay them and then request reimbursement, or if there's enough time, you could have, you know, the trust through the town make payment to the organization. So it could happen one of two ways, but there is, you know, there is funding to reimburse trust members for registration fees. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate that. So any other, anybody else want a last word? Sid, was that your hand going up? <laughs> no, you were just waving goodbye. <laughs> okay, well, oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> I hope this. Do we been... have to vote to adjourn? Oh yes, thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, I yeah. make a motion to adjourn. And is there a second? Okay, Carol, I see a second. Okay, so we have to have a roll call vote. Rob. Yes. Sid? Yes. Francis? Yes. Will? Yes. Carol? Yes. Erica? Erica? Yes. Yes, okay. 
And I'm a yes. So yes. I think that that wraps it up. Yes. We're done. Thank you again, everybody, for raising good Night. issues and good, good questions. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Hey, John, you had recorded this to, um, was it to the cloud? I did. I didn't start it immediately. That's fine. But that's, um, that's fine. If I hit stop recording, it's the town's going to be able to access it, right? That's what I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs>